Father, speak through us. Let us have our hope in you. Let us know you more. Let us be glorified at your coming, your second coming. Let us hopefully be glorified, your glorified second coming. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. So today is the very last message of this wonderful series we've been doing for the past couple of weeks on set, being set apart. This series we've been doing with every nation churches around the whole world since the beginning of this year. And I'm sure we've had a, a, a wonderful time doing it. Now today is the last message of this series and we'll be talking about when holiness, when being set apart will be completed. When everything will be made new. When everything we've been waiting for and longing for, both knowingly and unknowingly, will come to fruition. Because we'll be looking at the completion, the fruition of all things, naturally, today's scripture reading will be taken from Revelation. But this is where it encourages Christians from the time it was written until now to, to encourage Christians that God's perfect and God good way always wins in the end. Now for those of us who've been in church for some time, the, the book of Revelation has mystical, fat, mystical fascination. Whenever people read the book, ooh, Revelation, what's happening now? And with the internet now, where information spreads, spreads at a pace faster than we can process it, as soon as something in the world happens, we hear people asking, oh, wait, is this the time? Is it, is it happening now? Is, are we, are we doing, is, is that the mark of the beast? Is it, is, is it happening now? Is that the nation that was talked about in Revelation, which is going to be destroyed? We're trying to, we have prophecies and predictions trying to predict whether the time is now. This didn't just start now. This has been happening for centuries. And then we, then that doesn't happen, and then we calm down until the next event happens. Then it's all over again. Is it now? Is it, <laughs> is it happening now? But Revelations was not written to help us predict events in the world today. Just like it wasn't written for the first century Christians in Asia Minor to help them predict events of the world in that time, it was given, it was written to help them endure, to, to, to help them endure the Babylon of their time, which was the Roman Empire, as well as help us to endure the Babylon of today, wherever and whichever way we may find it. Last year, my wife and I had the privilege of visiting Rome, visiting Rome and Italy. While touring, while touring the Colosseum, we had a tour guide. The Colosseum is that big, broken building which is broken in half. So we had a tour guide, and he was telling us the history of Rome. Now, in his, not only Rome, but of the Colosseum too. Now, in his telling, one could almost see that he was not very favorable to Christianity. Because by his estimation and by his understanding, it was this Christianity which ended up destroying the greatness and the glory of Rome. I mean, he told us of wars in which Romans captured places and took inhabitants of those places as slaves to serve the Roman Empire. He told us how this Colosseum we were touring, sometimes, but not always, but just once in a while, Christians were taken and killed for entertainment because they paid their allegiance to someone else, firstly, besides paying their allegiance to Caesar. And this was the greatness he was supposedly longing for. And even to today, when we see God's good way, we see the world around us looking at Christianity and saying, it's destroying the greatness of our world, not realizing it's bringing about God's goodness in our societies and his glory in our societies. To the first century new Christian, this was the world that many were living in. And some chose to just give in and live according to the culture around them. 
live according to the ways of the people around them. Others compromised here and there by saying yes to some things they shouldn't have said yes to, but still trying to follow Jesus in the life that they were living. Or others just allowed people to infiltrate their Christian communities who were not really for Jesus and were therefore poisoning people of their communities. Others lived in fear of the world of Caesar around them, wondering when may people find out their true allegiance and what they would do. Now, to many people here, you can relate to this because this sounds awfully similar to what may be happening to many of us today. And to all of those living at that time, just to us living here today, the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation peels back the layers of what is actually happening in the world around us. What is, act, what is a real, the real reality? It shows that though the forces of darkness seem so pervasive, pervasive seem so pervasive then, and these forces of darkness seem so pervasive to the world around us today, as today through sin around us, as well as in our own hearts, through sickness, through death, and through the pain we experience, through relationship breakdown, and through betrayal, through the economic hardships we experience. Though this darkness seems like so real to us, though it seems like the greater reality, the real, real reality is that God is ultimately in control. And when Jesus comes back with strength and power, he will, be, he will come and destroy the darkness that seems to be so in control of our hearts, so in control of our communities, and so in control of our worlds. And he will, he will usher in his glorious reign over our whole world. The purpose of reading Revelation is not to speculate about what's happening outside of there, but to strengthen what's happening inside of here, both in our hearts and in our communities and in our world around us. So let's all stand as we read the verse. I'll read it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God, will, God himself will, will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It's done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning in the end, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of life, with the spring of water of life, without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Amen. So please take a seat. You see, when we see the goodness of the goodness and joy of our tomorrow, it can help us endure the pain and the suffering, as well as the temptation of today. A young footballer may have hopes of holding the AFCON Cup one day. Or a young swimmer could imagine herself receiving the Olympic medal one day. And with this vision in mind, they can endure the pain of the training when everyone else is enjoying their lives. In 1968, at the Olympics in Tanzania, there was, there was a man who represented Tanzania in the marathon, John Stephen Aquari. Now, during the race, he fell hard to the ground and dislocated his knee. Now, what everyone expected him to do at that time 
was to bow the race, go to hospital, and receive medical attention. But no, that's not what he did. Because firstly, in that race, 18 of the 75 people who started bowed down and didn't finish the race. But he resolved that he was going to finish the race. He eventually crossed the finish line more than one hour after the winner had crossed the finish line. Many of the spectators had already gone home, but the ones who remained stood there cheering and clapping for him as he crossed the finish line. When the reporters, when the reporters that day asked him why he had chosen to carry on, he said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish this race. Now the question stands before all of us today, are we going to finish this race that we have started? Are we going to complete the mission and the life devoted to God, to God that he has called us to? The question is, what stands at that finish line? Well, first of all, God will bless people with a new city, with, with a new creation, and a new city. In Genesis, I'm sorry, in the, in, in the verse we just read, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In Genesis 1, we read how there were chaotic waters all around the world. I can't think of a worse nightmare than to be lost in the middle of the sea with no land in sight, where you're completely subject to the forces of nature, completely out of your control. Especially for those of us who the gift of swimming never <sighs> infused our bodies. <laughs> but in the midst of these chaotic waters, God was there, hovering above the waters, just as he's in the midst of the chaotic waters that may be going on in your life right now. Be, be in the midst of the cha whatever chaotic storm you may find yourself in, which is beyond your control. And in the midst of these chaotic waters, he created land with vegetation and a whole natural ecosystem that supports our flourishing. Then in the crowning glory of his creation, God created us as humans to bear his image here on the earth. He gave them a command to be fruitful and build up this earth and to make something of it. But because of the human's original sin, sin came and infiltrated everything we did. So in our building of the earth, we also ended up building things that destroy in the building of our cities, I mean, we've built economic systems that unfairly exclude some people, and somehow we justify it and we call it fairness. In building our tools, we've created tools that harm and destroy people. In building software, which I do for a living, we've also built software that cause addiction, self-esteem challenges, and distraction from pursuing the life that God has called us to. What is quite evident is that in the good work that we were tasked to do, the sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve has caused all our best collective effort to fall short and also to do harm. Which is why it will be glorious when a new creation and a new city comes down from heaven. It already, starts, it, it already started at the cross where Jesus died for our sins, cleansing us from our sins so that we could live for him. He did what we could not do on our own, but only he could do with his power. And it will be, done, it will, it will be fulfilled when Jesus comes again, bringing a new creation, a new city, a world that we could not create on our own, but a new world where we can enjoy the full benefits of. 
in our Bibles, we see how God set apart the people of Israel to be a, a nation set apart from all other nations. We see how he says Jerusalem as a city in which his glory would dwell and his name would be known throughout the whole world. But, at, but by the time of Jesus, we could see that they had fallen short of this calling that they had been given. We saw how they had fallen short of being set apart as a, of a nation and how the leaders of Jerusalem had become so enmeshed with Rome, which was Babylon of, of, of that time. Yet in the final day when Jesus comes, we as his church, who have been set apart by giving our lives over to Jesus, will get to enjoy the new Jerusalem where his glory will be. His glory will, will dwell and darkness and corruption will never enter in. There will be no chaotic waters of the sea that you are experiencing today. There will be no sickness and fear. There will be no uncertainty and feeling of helplessness. There will be no temptation wondering whether we are on the right track or wondering whether we are acceptable to God. Just the blessed assurance that Jesus is mine and I am his. This is, why we can, this is why we can live holy lives today because we know that they will matter for tomorrow. We can, we can live holy lives today knowing that any alternative in choosing a way of darkness and sin and its destruction is a way that will be destroyed tomorrow. Therefore, it's not worth living today. It's really not worth it. The spurs are not only for the lives we lead as individuals, but to encourage others, too, to give their lives to Jesus so that they, too, can experience this eternal glory in him. The next part of this good news is that God will dwell with his people in the new Jerusalem. The verse says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, ooh, that's very small. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be, will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. In the new creation that God will give to us, he will also be with us. We will be able to see him and to touch him and to spend glorious time with him forever. No longer will we have to try and figure out what would Jesus do because we will see what he's doing every day. We will be there so we'll completely know what we should do in every situation. Too many of us who have sometimes felt alone and abandoned by God or you are for whatever reason not aware of his Holy Spirit which he sent to comfort us. When that day comes, you will never, ever have such a feeling again. We will live with the fullness of God with us as the dwelling place of God will be with us always and forever. Also because he lives with us, there can be no pain and no harm that could ever come near his presence. This means there will never again be sickness or death. There will be no anxiety or fear. There will be no envy or bitterness or relationship, rela relational dysfunction. Because we will be with God, full in his presence, there will be no darkness around us. We won't be taking sides in global wars because there will be no global wars. There will be no wars. Nations will not be fighting among other nations. There won't be strife within nations where one group dominates over another or one group, or one group hates another. All prejudice, all resentment, all pride, hatred, and vengeance will go away in light of his glorious presence. If that's how we'll be living then, 
Maybe as we pursue Jesus today, an attempt to know him more. Maybe that's the world we can try and create today. Every tear we've ever cried will be fully comforted then. Every wound we have today will be healed then. Every burden we carry today will be completely lifted tomorrow. What will become evident was that everything you experienced today was not in vain. Your frustrations of things not working out as you want them to, your relationships which are not as which is not restored as you hoped. Your finances, which just haven't balanced for a while, all will be made new when we dwell, when we dwell with Jesus. Lastly, those who thirst and overcome will inherit life with God in the new creation. The verse concludes by saying, and he said to me, it's done, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. It all starts and ends with Jesus. Everything in this world, from its creation to its ultimate glory, is Jesus. The question that stands today is, do you thirst for him? The question you can ask yourself today, do you want him? Have you chosen to give your life to him so that you too can freely enjoy the glorious life? It says the one who conquers will have this heritage. As we attempt to make something of of life in in our various Babylons, the destructive forces all around us, will we conquer and will we overcome and live with Jesus? When temptation comes your way to give up or to give in, will you choose to hold on to Jesus? Will you continue to persevere in the midst of continuous and sustained pressure to give up, will you persevere? And this, is not, this, is not, this is not a call for some kind of willpower that we can try and conjure up on our own, to conjure up in ourselves. This is not a call for the super strong Christians who have done things right all their lives. This is a call for us who are super weak, who say, I actually can't do this on my own. Jesus, I need you. In closing, as the worship team comes back up, this is a call to those of us who say yes to being set apart to depend daily on God. Because we really can't do this on our own. We really can't overcome on our own. It's a call to confess our sin to God and to confess our sin to each other so that we can be free from his power and live in the freedom that God has for us. It's a call to a a life of prayer and regular scripture reading because we need to speak to God and hear what he has to say for us. It's a call to be part of a set-apart community, which means being a part of our church, be involved by getting to know people, and giving, your life, giving yourself to their lives because we really can't overcome on our own. It's a call to tell others about Jesus so that they too can see his glory and they can ultimately live for him. We're going to finish by worshiping and then afterwards there'll be a chance to respond. Worthy, so worthy.